Hi and welcome to episode 47 of the Page One Podcast. I'm Marco. And I'm Tarek. Thanks for joining us at the Page One Podcast. If this is the first episode you're tuning into at the Page One Podcast, we like to speak to writers of all kinds, uh, authors, screenwriters, comic writers, video game writers, any kind of writer, to uh, learn about how they got into their industry, what their writing process is, and try and get as many hints and tips as possible. And as I say, this is episode 47, so there's a whole back catalogue of great guests there from people like Sarah Pimbera, Richard Morgan, Mike Carey. Uh, Last week we had Dirk Maggs, we've had Alistair Campbell, Ian Dunn, Stuart Heritage, Lauren Bukas. I mean, I could name everyone, and now I feel bad for the ones that I haven't named. But uh, what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of good episodes there, so uh, do do have a look at the back catalogue if you are interested. And we've got another great guest this week, Tarek. We do indeed. We are chatting this week to Owen Nichols, who is a screenwriter and an author. Mm -hmm. Uh, His first screenplay was a biopic of the filmmakers Powell and Pressburger, and it's uh, currently under option, so hopefully that will see the light of day soon. But Mm -hmm. more importantly for us, he's also written a novel called Love Unscripted, Mm -hmm. uh, which came out August 2019, and it's a kind of rom-com novel set in the world of um, cinema projectorists, and I think it's a fairly loosely based on some of his own experiences. Yeah, I think uh, as we discuss it, sort of um, maybe a, a, a who he was at one point, sort yes. of, if things had gone terribly wrong, <laughs> I think is, is <laughs> yeah, how he put it. The worst version of himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but, um, you know, and we actually talk about that, sort of write what you know and, and what that means. It doesn't mean literally write what you know, but drawing on your own experiences and stuff and pulling that into the story in any way that you can is always going to make it more real, I think. Yeah, just those little touchstones that kind of exactly make something stick or land a little bit. Because there's nothing worse than reading that little bit and you think, mm, I know that's not right, and it kind of pulls you up a little bit. So yeah. And we also uh, hear that um, Fight Club is a rom-com. Yeah, it's, I've, that's one film I've been watching wrong all these years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Go back and watch that with a different eye. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a great chat with Owen. Um, and... Uh, We'll just get straight into it after an advert for our uh, page one notebook, which is a writer's notebook uh, to help you plan your story. Uh, And then we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat and to let you know about next week's guest. But for now, on with the podcast. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read, or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just the story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made Page One. Page One is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story, so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realised you need to plan how to let people read it, so we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. You're obviously someone that has a great love of films. So when you were growing up, did you always want to 
write or did you want to work directly in movies? What, what, you know, what was your ambition when you were growing up? Yeah, write, writing has definitely been kind of the, the dream for a long time. And I think that's to do with my personality kind of. I've been on a couple of film sets, but the idea of being around lots of people doesn't really kind of suit my who I am. And as for being a director, like definitely not. I could never kind of stand in front of a room full of people and tell them like, this is what we're doing now and <laughs> do that better and you're rubbish. And you know, <laughs> yeah. I could be one of those friendly directors, but I don't know. You don't hear very often about them. <laughs> <laughs> and do you, um, because you started off down the journalism path, is that right? You, yeah. Before you got into your books and novels, yeah. Yeah, so there's kind of a, a weird set path I don't think well you definitely couldn't um follow anymore um because I I was a cinema projectionist so the novel Love Unscripted is about a cinema projectionist who loves movies we'll get onto that a bit later but it's definitely not autobiographical um but when I was a projectionist I started a blog um basically because I could watch movies around the same time as journalists would so I'd kind of get a bit of a head start on the general public I thought I could use that to my advantage and just wrote kind of just pithy little three paragraph film reviews but then one Christmas um, me and a projectionist friend were talking about what our favorite films of the year was and he said uh, well you can't really answer that because you haven't watched every film and I was like well no but nobody could watch every film and then it's like you could try though <laughs> um, so we set ourselves a kind of yes man challenge of watching every single film that was released and we worked in a 14 screen multiplex so this was like quite a lot of movies um he gave up about midway through january but for some reason <laughs> I, just, I just kept going um, the what, final what year was this so this was 2008 Okay. And I was trying lucky. to think what was out in 2008. Oh, there were some great films. We had um, In Bruges, um, Diving Bell and the Butterfly, No Country for Old Men, Wally. Um, yeah, Dark what, Knight, what, which... what were all the what were all the crap films? Oh man, oh there were some terrible, terrible films. Was Twenty Seven Dresses that year? <laughs> Maid of Honor was that. Oh man. Oh the, um, yeah, that, yeah. That the Gelo film where she's the maid and. No, I think it made was, in Manhattan. I'm getting my yeah, made made Manhattan, films mixed yeah. up. Clearly, so. Yeah, no, one of your favourite uh, genres. <laughs> my favourite genre. <laughs> 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 it was another. No, oh, it was Catherine Heigl that did low. She she's got a terrible reputation for being in kind of terrible movies, um, but no, I don't think it was her. I think it was. Um, it might have even been Michelle Monaghan who's good in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. She's a good actress, but you know, sometimes you've got to take the paycheck, I think. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it was it was a hell of a year, and I watched 189 films oh, and know. reviewed every one of them. Um, and about midway through the year, I started to like approach outlets like The Guardian and Enemy. And Enemy came back and said, actually, we we need some film content. Do you want to um, start on start on our site um, yeah so that was really nice um i've been thinking a lot about the enemy days recently there's been some sad news kind of out of obviously q magazine going under and yeah some other sad news and yeah it was, i kind of feel like it, it worked out okay but i didn't really take advantage i don't think of that job at that time it was kind of it was a good opportunity to kind of make my name as a journalist but I think I was always just a, a blogger and a kind of a kind of a snarky blogger as well. Like I was kind of pushed into this kind of um, like I'll try and make them as kind of uh, what's the word antagonistic as possible. But I do um, wonder that about you know sometimes when you read columns about films or music or, or these sorts of things, if it, how much of it is a is a real person behind it, or how much you're creating a sort of personality to. To talk that is about exactly these things. what it was. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. There was a, there was Owen Nichols, the film reviewer, and he was a bit of a. Can I swear on this? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, he, he was a dick. Uh, he, was a, <laughs> he was a dick. He was kind of, yeah, like because I love movies, and I think I kind of made up this character that 
sort of didn't like movies and was just really kind of belligerent about it and really kind of oh I could do so much better and it's like well, I definitely couldn't um so yeah that was kind of a yeah a weird time but that led me to making a couple of friends who um were a lot of journalists I think want to write their own stuff and there's a there's a divide between the people who just want to write about stuff that they love and then the others are kind of they want to watch as much stuff because they want to make their own stuff and um yeah me and a couple of others I know really wanted to make stuff and one of them introduced me to his agent I wrote a script about the filmmakers Powell and Pressburger mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah um, it's kind of biopic of them and that's how I got an agent and then that led to me having a few meetings kind of all over the place and then um I was accepted to, and then yes yeah, so with scripts as you both know if you kind of write is that you'll get people telling you it's fantastic the best thing they've ever read and you'll be like oh this is it this is like my my ticket to the big time and then it'll just all collapse um, so that happened a few times and I was kind of well this is depressing um, <laughs> maybe I should write a novel just because then it's something that's mine it's kind of yeah totally. when I finish it because the screenplay is just a blueprint to be turned into a movie but a novel like even if it just sits on my shelf it's it's mine and I can send it to people and I can send it to my mum and she'll understand it if I send her a script she'll be like x int <laughs> yeah um but with a novel it's kind of yeah everybody can kind of appreciate it and so I was working as I've sort of given up the film journalism stuff because it's a very hard job to kind of make a living out of um and I was working as a copywriter for a bank it was kind of a you know the job that you do as you try to struggle on and um yeah, somebody recommended this Norfolk-based writer's mentorship. So I, I submitted my first few chapters, was accepted onto that, and that's kind of how eventually I got got the literary agent and the publishing deal. And so, you know, how easy was it to make that transition from writing screenplays into writing a novel? Because obviously they're quite different... Um, I mean, Tarek and myself have written some screenplays together and then we write novels as well separately. But, you know, they're, they're very different mediums. So how easy was it for you to transition between the two? Um, I think it was because I never expected anything from it. It felt quite easy at the time. It was, um, If you've read the book, it, it kind of reads like a film. It's kind of very quick scenes. It's kind of it's it was written as a sort of I could picture it as a movie as I was writing it and I think it's very dialogue heavy and kind of it jumps all over the place narratively um time time wise um and so yeah it, it it felt natural and I took one of the biggest kind of things I ever learned on my film course which was get in and out of a scene as quickly as possible which in, I think in novels, you, you're allowed to kind of spend a lot longer kind of setting up the where and everything like that. But the thing that I've learned from screenwriting is people's attention just will wane so quickly. Mm-hmm. So I just I just took this idea that, no, I'll, I'll keep it as these are scenes. They're not chapters. They're just scenes. So we need to get in and out as quickly as possible. I mean, I was going to say, it is a, it is a book that it has... It, it was very filmic in its structure, I thought, w- with the multiple timelines and things like that. So, I mean, was it an idea that you had had as a potential script that you decided to try and write into a novel, or did it come to you as a novel idea, if you see what I mean? Well, yeah, no, it, it definitely was a, a script idea first. I really wanted to write my own kind of before sunrise. Mm-hmm. And yes. I thought, because there's a thing about when you... St- really like movies and you kind of a lot of the time people will watch films that they really revere and think i want to make that but i think the trick is to watch to find out who that filmmaker was or who that writer was and look at the first thing they ever did Mm -hmm. because the first thing they ever did is 
how they got to that second thing. So like, if you love train spotting, you're not going to get to make train spotting first time round, but you might get to make shallow grave. Yeah. Like, yeah. Don't watch Fleabag and think I can make that. Watch Crashing and think, oh, actually, maybe I could do that. And I'd be my one tip to people is to look at debuts and look at the things that made people's names. Mm-hmm. Don't look at the thing that's massive that everybody loves because a lot of the time studios and it's the same for novels as well if it's too far out there they'll just go no Mm -hmm. they don't know who you are and they don't want to trust you on something that's not kind of i think i've gone way off tangent there what was i think think that's actually a good point because i think we've we've had a few folk on before who have or when we didn't spoke about it before where someone has what looks like an overnight success but you don't drill into the time and the the grounding that was laid up to that point and i think it's easy to look at something big and think that's what i need to do replicate that but you're but you're right you need to go before that and replicate the path up to that point and yeah how did they actually get going what was your first step rather than just leaping into the big the big hit that everyone knows that was my thing with before sunrise it was kind of that's a small thing that potentially could get made or something like in search of a midnight kiss this is kind of a couple of characters few locations go as small as you possibly can and as personal as you can as well. Mm-hmm. This book, Love Unscripted, couldn't be more personal. It's about a guy who worked in the cinema and loves movies and doesn't really understand what a real relationship is. And at some point in my life, I was exactly that mm-hmm. person. It's a very kind of worst case scenario retelling of my um, <laughs> life. But that was the thing that I think made it kind of stand out for when I sent it off for submission, people kind of like, they could see that this is as personal as it could be. Um, So yeah, when I was first considering it as a script, I wanted it to be low budget Mm -hmm. and as personal Mm -hmm. as possible. And now we're kind of talking about adapting it and we're almost having to go all the way back Mm -hmm. to that because actually the complex time structure that the novel has isn't going to translate to a big screen it's going to be too complex Mm -hmm. it's going to be too kind of Mm -hmm. too much too many moving parts so now we're kind of like actually can we make it two nights possibly the night they meet and the night they break up and i think again that's kind of while i've got a book behind me i'm still a brand new screenwriter that's never had anything produced so i need to get something that's small that doesn't feel like a big chance that people will take on it Mm -hmm. yeah and then hopefully they'll say yes. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, given the the subject matter of Love Unscripted, you know, is it a case of write what you know? Are you a big believer in that sort of cliche that always gets thrown about? Or is it important to, you know, obviously you draw, when you're writing something, you draw on the experience of your life, whatever that is, and then you can put it in writing, but it can go off in any sort of direction. So, I mean, you know, why did you want to focus it on something that you had done so closely? I think, I think it is. No, I think it. I think it completely depends on the writer whether or not it's right what you know. Mm-hmm. It, for me, it massively benefited me because it was the first time that I'd ever written something so big. So I thought, actually, knowing every little detail of it without having to go out and research it, because especially when you've been when you're writing on spec or you know, just writing for yourself, you have no idea if you're going to get to the end. Yeah. But by picking something that I knew, it just made it kind of so much easier to get to that vomit draft. Oh, this is a thing. Maybe I can mold it and mold it and mold it Mm -hmm. until it becomes something good. But I think it's, it's similar to the point about with your first thing, it should be something smallish. I think maybe with your first thing, it should be something personal because then it's sort of, it's easier when you're in that room and you're talking to somebody about it. You've got so much more to talk about mm-hmm. because you've lived that. But then there are there are thousands of writers that have never written what they know that maybe they have better imaginations than me. No, but um, I mean, I think even in these, you know, even if you're writing a sort of sci-fi epic, you, the character you know a good sci-fi will be grounded exactly, yeah. with yeah. characters that you that the reader recognizes because they're like real people and that is what 
that's probably maybe the right what you know aspect of a novel like that you know so i think i think in most stories there will be an aspect of right what you know it's just that sometimes the setting might be entirely different or something yeah. like that i think it's more put yourself in it than write what you know mm -hmm. yeah that's maybe a better it, way to put it yeah yeah make it as personal as you possibly can mm -hmm. um and even if that is because robots fighting aliens but it's about ultimately about a son reconciling with his father mm -hmm. that's the thing that people will latch onto they've mm -hmm. seen robots they've seen aliens but it's that personal aspect and i think with love unscripted obviously it's the only thing that i've sold that to an extent that people have seen it, I think I can say that it's the personal aspect that made it stand out. Mm -hmm. So then, if if you're writing a book that's maybe semi autobiographical is too strong a word, but it's certainly based quite heavily on 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 you or you as a character at one point in your life, when you when when you come to sit down and actually planning that, how does that affect the planning part of it? When you say you know because. How how much do you borrow from real events, and how much do you say actually I don't want to talk about that, or I need to embellish that? You know, how do you how do you plot and plan something like that? I think I I took the because structure is kind of such an inherent part of script writing. Mm -hmm. I think much more than novel writing. I think when you're writing a book, it's kind of you can meander a bit. It's good to have to know where you're going, but I absolutely structured it like a screenplay. And so the only thing that I really took in terms of, I, I took more character than plot from my own life. So plot wise, all I really had was this night of Obama's election. Like once I had that as a ticking clock, I was kind of right. I know that if I said it all on one night, that's going to be the ending. Obama is going to be president. That's the backdrop. Mm, yeah. So what happens up until that point? And then it's kind of just filling the gaps with kind of funny and silly scenarios. But knowing that once I had the second timeline, I knew that I wanted it to mirror. So when he's, spoiler alert, kind of messing things up because his self-confidence is so low, that has to be mirrored in the 2008 scenes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. having that structure made it really, really kind of not easy it was hard work but it just it, everything just fitted into place like a jigsaw it was just mm -hmm. kind of right this this marries up so i mean are you a big planner then in advance is that something you brought from this sort of script writing you, is it important to you to to have the the thing mapped out quite clearly before you actually start start on uh -huh. it? yeah 100 percent. i have to know where it's going i don't need to know kind of every chapter but a lot of the time now I'll write um, like a one which will kind of break down the beats of the story. Um, so we're sort of pitching for the third book now. And thankfully my agent's been kind of like, no, I don't like that idea. No, I don't like that idea. No, I don't like that idea. <laughs> and we've got to an idea that she really, really does like. And But in that process, I've been writing out exactly what happens in each of these stories. Mm -hmm. um, and so when it comes to actually writing it, it'll change massively yeah. because a lot of the time it's kind of, it might just be a couple of days where I'm just trying to bash out a structure that I recognize as a structure. Um, and then, yeah, that idea of knowing exactly how it starts and knowing exactly how it ends, it is a bit of a kind of fill in the gaps thing. Mm-hmm. And and you 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 sort of referred earlier to sort of vomit draft. I mean, are you someone that once you start writing it, do you do you like to try and sort of power through it, even if you're getting to bit? You know, we all have those moments in a story where you're like, this isn't or what's happening yeah. here. But you kind of just thing I've ever you push. <laughs> do you just push through it, or do you try and fix those points as you're doing it, or do you push through it to the end and then take stock and go back and redraft it at that point? yeah i push through to the end that's kind of I, i'll that's what helps so massively about having this plan beforehand of kind of right mm. this is the story i'll know kind of some so for love unscripted i did actually have like chapter one chapter two chapter three and i'd i'd write exactly what i wanted to happen in each one and that really was a case of like get the vomit draft out just keep going just mm. keep going um but there's a there's a little note on my wall written 
by my wife that says just write even if it's not good you'll hate yourself less than writing nothing and i think that I like, like that. that's, that's yeah, good. yeah it's really nice um she did that when i was like having a real funk on the second book and i was just i was doing that thing of just like oh this is rubbish i need to rewrite mm. it i need to and it's like actually having a like 1500 whatever your word count is just have that and get through it and it doesn't matter if it is rubbish it really doesn't it's mm. about getting to the next bit because you can't make nothing better but you can make something better yeah yeah and what's a what's a typical day for you like then you know how, what's your what's your structured day in terms of do you write at the same time every day do you can you only write if you've tidied the house and got to go to <laughs> next year or something well i've got two little ones so they often oh well get us up at <laughs> um and then kind of usually by nine I can kind of be at my desk um before all this horribleness mm. of 2020 started I used to actually <laughs> cliche like right in the cafe of my local cinema oh nice and so it was always a case of get there nice and early do as if you can get to your word count there's 14 screens that you can go <laughs> and treat yourself to. Um, <laughs> But you can't do that every day, um, I've been told. Um, so I would have like, yeah, Monday I might do that. And then Tuesday I'll write around a friend's house. And then I kind of had a sort of not a rigid structure, but just a kind of a nice, a nice routine, basically. Yeah. So what I always wanted to do was write a bit on the novels in the morning and then the scripts in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. But yep. it's, just, it's never happened. I don't know why I think. If I ever have that like mad dash of actually getting out a couple of thousand words, I do feel spent after it. Yeah. I think. And also, I suppose yeah. writing a novel and a screenplay are they're completely different beasts. Certainly, you know, ones to get in the mindset to jump from one mindset to the other mindset in a day is probably quite quite hard to do. I imagine, especially if you've really got into into the mindset of writing a novel and you've done a few thousand words to try and shift gears is quite hard. Absolutely, yeah. The the kind of the novel writing is kind of quite free flowing and like we say the vomit draft it's kind of you can just spread your wings a little bit with it and kind of stretch out but with a screenplay you really are kind of like you've got such small amount of space to yeah. get over what you want yeah. to get over and it is about kind of does that line work no it doesn't right try try this one and, and you'll rewrite the same line maybe fish and i know some novelists that do do that as well they will be kind of like no this line and the next yeah. line uh -huh. yeah. yeah i'm i'm not that pernickety when it comes to the novel as long as it kind of is doing what it needs to do and it feels like so far i've written from first person twice so as long as it feels like the character saying that i can kind of get away i think yeah. with a bit more of kind of just having them just spill their thoughts onto the page yeah and did did you i should ask this earlier but did you have the same agent for your your screenplay work and your novel or did it did you have to get I, a different agent for the novel i had to get a different agent for the novel and then i left my agent for the right. screenwriting okay and i didn't have to leave that was just mm -hmm. a yeah um but then now my literary agent is also my screenwriting agent right okay yeah because she's fantastic she's yeah and was it easy to you know did the grounding in the screenplay world the screenwriting world in terms of you know you you had an agent and you'd had the Powell and Pressburger I think you had optioned that is that is that yes. right yeah, yeah. did that help you secure that. an agent for the novel or was it like starting afresh almost i think it helped definitely i think so i was on the escalator scheme which was run by the writer center in norwich which is mm -hmm. now the national writer center i think having that having the journalism as well and also having um so the yeah the agent the mentorship and the journalism background i think are all just things that kind of get your opening letter read mm -hmm. it's kind of just yeah okay he's, he's not somebody who hasn't tried something yeah and it'd be the same for you guys you'd have like 
oh, we have this writer's podcast. Mm -hmm. And I think put something like that in an open letter and people go, okay, because, you know, they'll get, a, they get a lot of submissions. No, that's right. You're Some people don't really think it through when they're submitting. But if you put all the things that kind of make you stand out, I think mm -hmm. you've got a better chance of just grabbing their attention. And then it, you know, obviously the book has to be. St yeah, absolutely. Well. Yeah, it's all about trying to, try to get to the top of that that pile and and then yeah. as you say the book has to stand on its own at that point but yeah. at least at least it draws their attention i suppose i mean did yeah. you it did it doesn't sound then like you had you know a lot of um novelists who are starting out would have that period of sending out lots of query letters and rejections and things like that did you go through that process or was it a fairly easy process for you well i, I went through all that kind of process probably in my early 20s i'm 38 now i went through that process when i was trying to get my screenplays made mm -hmm. so it's kind of rejection rejection and thank god they rejected me because some <laughs> of the stuff i wrote when i was like in my early 20s was awful and i'm glad it never ever got produced um but yeah so i was kind of had that rejection before but i was very very fortunate this time around i think that i've got to a certain level where it was kind of because I was on this scheme, we had a like reading um, thing at the end of the course mm -hmm. where you'd go and you'd do your first couple of chapters. And that was kind of an industry event, lots of agents and publishers. And quite a few after that kind of gave me their card. And there was, again, it was that thing of as soon as you've got a little bit of in interest from some yeah. people, everybody else kind of then goes, oh, now I understand that this might not be like everything else on the slush pile. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, yeah, it's kind of, you shouldn't lie, but if you were <laughs> to say, um, yeah, I've got some interest from somebody else, it's amazing kind of what it will do. Yeah, it suddenly but, cause it to jump up, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so is that, is it, what, what what kind of course was that exactly, sorry? Oh, so it was, it's called the Escalator Scheme, and it okay. used to be open just to people who live in the east of England, Right. Um, but I think it's national now. And the idea is that they pit, they select 10 um, mental, mentees, <laughs> 10, 10 writers who submit like their first three chapters. Uh -huh. um, and then you get put with a mentor, somebody who's had a book published, and they kind of help you um, basically get it into a shape where you can submit it. And at the end of the, so it's about nine months, I think, the course, okay. um, you do a reading at an industry kind of um, event mm -hmm. and that was really really helpful like i had a really cool guy ben johncock he wrote a book called the last pilot um and yeah it was kind of it was sort of invaluable it's kind of it's difficult to know which of the things helped kind of get yeah yeah where it all kind of to, feeds but... it kind of feeds the beast and everything ties in together and yeah yeah and, exactly yeah and we've we've, we've chatted to a few folk before who have we've done similar courses or kind of creative courses with ties to agents or publishers. And I think everyone's always said that they're, that they're really good things because I mean, it's all, it's all training. It's all exposure to the industry a bit, especially for people who don't know how those things work behind the scenes. Um, and is that, is it something that you would, you would recommend if folk can do it, there's no harm in doing it type of thing. You know, it can only be, be a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Any, anything that I would say the biggest benefit is that it will just get you writing. Mm -hmm. Like, anything that any kind of a deadline even if it's self-imposed or if you just think oh i've got this thing coming up and i've got to get it ready for that yeah. you will sit down and you'll write more um it's weird before i had my two kids I, so i did the i did the ma i haven't mentioned this i did the ma of screen writing at the uea so it was kind of the creative mass creative writing masters uh -huh. um and obviously that probably helped as well when I submitted mm -hmm. um but I did that and I, and I wasn't writing and then I had my first child in 2014 and as soon as like this isn't a kind of cheesy oh now that I've got kids I know know what to write it was more a kind of now I have no time I have to use the time to write yeah, yeah. So I had like, I was working a full-time job had a small child I was trying to do kind of like a little bit of freelance work on the side and I had so little time that it was like, oh, I've got an hour. I have to write. And so yeah. I wrote most of Love Unscripted in 
in my lunch hour at work it would literally like it was 12 o'clock and I had a very understanding boss I'd be like all right 12 o'clock I'm done I'll be back at one mm-hmm. and I would use that hour and that was every day and that all adds up so much like yeah. so when you're in a job that you really don't particularly like and it's kind of like getting you down that escape and that kind of because you're going to be there for not quite 365 days a year but you know you're going to be in that environment so there's nothing to kind of it's not like at the end of the day where you go oh i'm really tired i'm not going to bother writing today it was like no this is my lunch hour yeah. and i have my sandwich and i'm gonna write and drop crumbs into yeah the i mean these sort of things can they can go two ways can't they they sort of can help you focus and say right what is it that i it's, you know is is the writing important to me and then make you focus on it or it can i suppose push you the other way <laughs> and, you know that's <laughs> yeah. when a lot of people will give up on that on that yeah, dream. Yeah. so i suppose that's when you kind of discover if, if it is something you want to do or not for real and, but, it, and it really is about giving up and, mm-hmm. and what about, about not giving up because you know i think everybody at some point thinks oh i'd like to you know the the, the dreams that you have when you're younger is kind of they all get pushed out of you at some point and I do believe I don't believe everybody who doesn't give up will make it but I know that the people that yeah. do give up won't yeah mm-hmm. yeah absolutely and do you obviously in screenwriting there's this thing of um getting notes from people and stuff like that and re- responding and redrafting on the basis of of that sort of process um is is that something you've gone through with your screenplays and is it a similar process you know as someone that's that's worked in both fields is it a similar process when you get edits and stuff from your editor as well it, it's not as painful and it's more painful <laughs> in any <laughs> kind of past i think so there's this major the screenplay that i got the furthest having it optioned and kind of that had a lot of producer notes and they would come back and they'd be kind of they'd rarely be things that i kind of disagreed with but they'd always be kind of there'd always be another one mm-hmm. so you kind of do it and then be, no there's another one another one with the novel writing they've been kind of big edits so it'll be like okay right we've read it we like it but and then they'll kind of give you a big chunk and then you'll go through that chunk and if there's stuff that you disagree with you don't do but a lot of the time you'll kind of you will find either a middle ground or you'll see why they're right yeah um and so have it i don't know what's worse having kind of small notes over and over and over again <laughs> or big notes in one go but that's definitely the difference between yeah. writing and the novel writing but i know people who have written screenplays that have done like hundreds of drafts like literally yeah. hundreds of drafts and i i don't think you could do that on a novel well, <laughs> I, think, yeah. I mean that's something that is uh, someone else i, I think it might have been Sarah Pimbra possibly said that, you know, the, the thing with a novel is that it there is a finish line to it that you, you know, it, it does finish. With, whereas with a screenplay, it can, it can you can finish your screenplay, then you, as you say, you get all these notes and you keep having to work on it and work on it. But even then, at that, at that moment, you've still got the thing going into production, getting made, maybe changes there at that point, and it goes on and on and on, and it kind of lingers <laughs> in a way that yeah. that maybe your your brain is ready to to move on but you can't because it, it it's a much longer process and you're no longer in control of it as you said before you, you're you've sort of handed it over and, and other people start start t- tearing it apart <laughs> yeah absolutely I, I think like for your mental health <laughs> novel writing is definitely better than screenplay yeah because <laughs> i sort of, sort of said this to a few friends how quick i found from submitting to being published. I think I, I know I was lucky, mm. but um, compared to film, it's just it's crazy. It's like for a novel, yeah, you've basically a massive exaggeration, but you've got a agent says yes, and they'll, 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 then they'll send it to a publisher. And if they like it, they'll say, yes, you'll have a novel. Um, but for a film, you need an agent and then they need to send it to a producer and then they need to get financiers and they might get a director first, but then they really need to get an actor to say yes if it's a kind of actor-led mm-hmm. movie. 
and you'll get notes from all of these people and you'll also get notes from costume designers and you, you'll literally just by the end of it it might not be yours but it was never you have to know that going mm. in that the screenplay yeah. that you write isn't going to end up as the film that you want it to it is a collaborative medium more than any other you just have to make your peace with that um, mm. if not then go write a novel <laughs> and and the I mean, to kind of go back to the novel for for a moment, the the novel that you have written is, as as you said, it's it's kind of based a little bit on, perhaps a version of you when you you were younger, um, and with your with your second novel, um, which I'm right in saying is, you've you've written, but it's not yet obviously, but um, is yeah. it coming out shortly? Or what what's the? I just submitted the hopefully last round of edits on okay. last Friday. Very um, exciting. Obviously, because of this year, I think we were hoping that it would be out in September this year, but because of childcare and mm -hmm. everything else, it's kind of they've given me until you know now to finish it, and then I think we'll look at twenty twenty one for actually releasing it, nice. which is which is 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 nice because then hopefully the world be a little bit more not on fire, yeah. yeah. Uh, but then, so so when it came to writing the the second book. You know what, what was your approach there in terms of the idea? Did you want to return to something that was kind of semi based on on true stories, or did you have an idea for something completely made up? Yeah, I had the idea for something really kind of. It was a bit like um, I don't know if you've ever seen the film A Matter of Life and Death. Like it's this big. It's about this guy who um, he's a World War Two pilot, and his plane goes down, but it's foggy, so the people in charge of like heaven basically can't find him and they leave him alive <laughs> and he meets this woman and he falls in love and then the people up in heaven come down and say hey wait a second you were supposed to be dead and he was like hey i was happy to die yesterday but i've just met this woman mm -hmm. we're madly in love and i don't want to go now um and so they have this big court case to kind of decide whether or not he can stay alive anyway the idea <laughs> that i had originally I like was very very um kind of miraculous and otherworldly and the publishers and agents kind of went, yeah, but your first book wasn't. So <laughs> actually, I think it probably isn't a bad idea if you kind of do something a bit more contemporary. Um, so I kind of dialed everything back, but I kept um, one of the main threads, which was that I wanted one of the romantic couple to be a comedian and the other one to be a musician. And so I took that and now it's a kind of a love story about two people who are kind of trying to make it in the entertainment world in the UK mm -hmm. um, and so yeah it's a kind of a love story set over a few years as they kind of um, try to realize their dreams but as, as for the writing of it it's such a different experience when you're when you know that it's going to be a book on a shelf yeah. like mm -hmm. when I was writing the first one I didn't have any of that pressure um and all the time pressure either it's kind of i will finish it when i want to mm -hmm. but this time around it's kind of it really is like oh no no we need to see some stuff by this date and some stuff by this date and perversely i have all the time now because you know this is my full-time job um but it doesn't work like it doesn't work like oh i've got nine hours now i'm gonna write for nine no. hours. Uh -huh. it's kind of i'm gonna write for a couple of hours and then go watch a movie <laughs> 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 yeah and when you when your first book came out, um, what you know, I mean, you, know, you 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 said there that you kind of you had an idea for a book, and then you were told, well, you know, it's your first book was always about this, more in line with that. And is that is that something that you've experienced? Is that, um, you know, you've you've rewritten one type of book, and so that's a kind of book that you're expected to keep writing. Is, is that is that kind of how it is, or is it, or will you have more freedom once once you've had a few more books under on, on your belt? Yeah, definitely the. Both both of those points, I've kind of we've had the conversation for it's like, oh, do I do I have to write this or can I? And yeah. we're kind of, well, we would prefer you to write. You don't have you can write whatever you want. <laughs> it would be a preference if you write this. Um, but luckily, like I, you know, romantic stories and kind of love stories. Every, well, not every book or film, but a lot of books and films have that romance element. Mm -hmm. You know, even mm -hmm. even something like Fight Club, I argue to people that's a rom-com you know it's about a guy who, <laughs> who, 
he literally can't talk to women so he invents somebody who <laughs> can talk to women and then he gets the girl at the end what isn't a rom-com about that? <laughs> um so luckily i can't have of... to watch that film again though yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah i'll get some very angry tweets about that yeah. um <laughs> but um yeah so love stories are kind of my thing so i'm very happy to kind of continue in that genre and then i have the novel uh the screenplays for when i kind of want to unleash a dark side um, I, I was going to ask because i mean you are still writing screenplays as well as as yeah. doing novels as well so i mean is that do you work on them at the same time or do you like to try and get a draft of the novel done and then focus on the screenplay i know you said you can't do it on the same day but do you work on them simultaneously yeah i do i like to kind of have um especially i the vomit draft is always my favorite draft so i kind of and then after that it is kind of shaping it to be um something that isn't just in my head because that vomit draft is kind of it's so full of gaps like people be like okay we get this but why is that person doing that I'm like, well in my head i know so uh, mm -hmm. oh you want me to explain it so that the readers can understand yeah. it okay yeah all right <laughs> i get that um so um that's kind of my favorite bit of the novel writing process but when i'm in the edits i kind of do need another project to kind of keep myself kind of happy i suppose yeah <laughs> um, yeah so yeah i will i will write other screenplays at the same time as i'm writing the novel but then it was kind of a bit weird because we had the edits for the first novel when I was writing the second and then trying to come up with an idea to pitch for the third one while I was doing the edits on the second so there are times when everything just kind of smushes up on you and mm. you've kind of got a few projects on the go but I mean for me certainly I find I know what you mean about the vomit dropping the foot but you know that's that's the creative bit you know that's the most creative bit because you're getting that idea that's been in your head down for the first time and yeah. then editing and redrafting can turn into a bit of a slog sometimes because um, yeah. you're you have, sorry so, you have good days and bad days with that with that edit. Mm -hmm. it will be like some days you'll be like oh my god this isn't the thing that i thought it was mm -hmm. but then some days you'll you'll get that back and the edit can be really really great but I know exactly what you mean, sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, so, I mean, it, it makes sense to have another creative outlet while you're, do, while you're doing the editing process as well because you're then getting to go back to that sort of base creativity, if you, if you like. Exactly, and, yeah. And do that as well, yeah. No, that makes yeah, a lot of sense. That bit where you can just spark, and it, it can be anything. Like, some people are scared of the blank page, but I'd imagine the three of us actually quite like it because mm -hmm. it could be absolutely anything you want it to be um so yeah a, a new idea is always kind of i can't remember who it was but somebody was talking about how it's like um it's almost like a relationship where you're kind of like you can be married to an idea for ages and then like another shiny cute idea comes along yeah. and you're like oh that yeah. one's really nice but no actually the main <laughs> focus focus yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> And would you ever want to write uh, something else? Like, I don't know if you're at all into sort of graphic novels or comics or anything like that. Would you ever be interested in writing in another format as well as the novels and the screenplays? Well, I actually wrote with a projectionist friend um, years and years ago. I wrote a screenplay and he tried to turn it into a graphic novel. It, it never really got off the ground. But yeah, I really enjoyed that kind of process. Mm -hmm. It was almost like he was storyboarding it. It mm -hmm. was kind of like I got to see it flesh again it was one of those things that in my early 20s that so <laughs> really glad didn't get me <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was kind of fun to, that was the first time i think i'd ever seen my words almost written by somebody else like the same or yeah the same way when you pick up the book and you're mm. like oh those are my words and somebody's gone to the trouble of yeah. typesetting them and that's kind of that's a nice feeling so yeah uh, would i would i yeah yeah there's, there's i love stories so any kind of medium mm -hmm. i would like to see that story in like i'm right i'm not writing but i have an idea there's a children's book that my kids read that i love like i'm not being cute when i say it's one of my favorite books of all time and i think it would make a perfect like big screen kids musical like a oh, kind of brilliant. lego um mm -hmm. Moana, like a big kind of like silly fun yeah. 
yeah. um, musical. And I was thinking, oh, but it could also be a stage thing. Um, but it's just another one of those ideas where it's like, stop that, do the other bit. <laughs> yeah. and then you can treat yourself to that at four o'clock for an hour if yeah. you've been good. Yeah. Uh, what are you are you able to tell us? You can maybe tell us after what the, what that book. Yeah, is. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I I spoke to the guy who wrote it, agent, and it hasn't been optioned for film, but I'm not in a position to kind of offer a kind of cash amount so no. we just have to come to some kind of hopefully we'll get a shopping agreement where i can kind of send it to people and say i think this is a thing because i really think it's a thing um but yeah yeah we'll see bro we'll see. nice and uh would you want to you obviously you're focused on it well as you said, you've, it's a love story of the first book and the second book will be as well would you like to write something in a completely different genre or is that the sort of st story you would always want to tell i think novel wise i think i'll i like i like the structure of a kind of man meets woman stuff happens they get together but i had an idea recently for something that's very much man meets woman at the end they have a like a companionship at the end it's not a kind of you know mm. they, i don't really like happy ever afters like even love unscripted i think is very kind of you know you'd have to be quite cynical to think that it goes badly but mm. at the same time it's not kind of you know chasing somebody down to the airport and yeah kissing as the music swells it's kind of yeah. I, li yeah. I like things that have a slightly kind of ambiguous life isn't like it is in the movies yeah kind of um tinge to them so yeah i definitely want to um not just write boy meets girl stuff but um i i love that genre so i'm more than happy to do my thing within that genre you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah and uh, what's next so you've got the second book coming out um but is there you said there's a third book that you've just have you just pitched that or is it yeah, how far along it. is it on? well i pitched it to my agent and mm -hmm. she loves it which is great news because we kind of went round with a few ideas and she's like not really worth it. but then it's the first time i've ever had a high concept um and it's kind of a high concept but i'm really really happy with it i think it could be a lot of fun to write so that's the third one if anybody mm -hmm. well i've got a two book deal so now i'm kind of you know basically almost back out there again kind yeah. of like hoping that somebody says yes you can carry on doing this and um that's the dream and then yeah a possible adaptation for love unscripted um a tv show that me and a friend wrote that has got optioned as well so we're kind of waiting to see what production companies nice. say about that and then yeah just just writing as much as i possibly can and kind of because there'll be a lot of no's even when you get something yeah. published there'll be a lot of no's and you've just got to keep on writing mm -hmm. yeah no absolutely and the 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 adaption of um love unscripted is that is that i think we you chat about it at the start briefly but is that an adaption that you're working on yourself or are you actually going to adapt the book into a script yourself yes yeah so we um my agent put me in touch with a director that really likes the novel and we're basically just kind of trying to get it into a place where we can send it to people um, because it's a tough sell to just make the novel into a film. Like I said, the mm -hmm. timelines and everything, um, I think it's just, it's not, it, we haven't quite cracked that this is what it is thing that we can yeah. mm -hmm. send to producers. Um, so we're doing that at the moment and then we might co-write. I might just have a go at the draft and send it off and then we'll kind of see what happens. But yeah, hopefully, hopefully. It, but I think it's going to be a very d different beast um, than what the book is. I mean, th th this is a more going back to the start question, but d I'm genuinely interested as if you write a screenplay, you know, because we've asked other people and some people have said that if you're not in L.A. or whatever, then writing, getting a film made is, you know, forget about it kind of a thing. Um, obviously, there is a British film industry as well, but yeah. the path to it isn't as clear, I wouldn't have said, for someone that wants to start out on it than with a novel where the path is always, you know, query letter, three chapters, follow the submission guidelines, see what happens, you know, get rejections, move through it and keep going. 
Whereas with a screenplay for whether it's a film or a TV or something like that, um, the path isn't, it, there, it doesn't seem to be as clear as what you should do if if that's a world that you want to move into. Absolutely. I think ugh, there was a, a lot of people will tell you, you just got to go make it yourself. But like I said at the start, I'm, I don't have that personality of being mm-hmm. somebody that kind of could te- coerce people into doing what I want them mm-hmm. to do. So mm-hmm. I don't think like, like directing was never a thing. And then, but if you, if you network well and make lots of friends within the industry, then you can just send them scripts, but mm-hmm. then you've still got all those no's that come back, which is, you know, then trying to get funding for it. And, um, you can, it's so hard. It is so hard to get an agent to get, companies to say yes because all they want to do is say no that's mm. kind of that's their job I, I can't remember what i was listening to the other day where um somebody was saying that you know a development effect all they want to do is not get fired that's their like main thing it's just it's their job so mm. the, the way they cannot get fired is by not making things that fail so if they just say no to everything, they're not going to get fired. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's your job to make them say yes. Yeah, yeah. It's so hard when somebody wants to say no. So, <laughs> yeah, how do you get into the UK industry? I don't know because I I, I haven't. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, this is quite a smart path, I think. Get a book done because I've sent this book to producers that I really really like in the UK, and they've said that they love it. They're not at the point now where they want to make a Mm rom-com and they have the same kind of um difficulties with the novel being translated that i do where it's kind of it's not clean enough yet um but yeah once you've got something that people can read then they'll be a bit more interested in you than they would be if you just sort of send enough scripts that probably aren't even going to get to their table really Mm -hmm. it's it's a hard industry yeah, it's, it's, it, I just find it odd sometimes. I've, you know, there's a uh, publishing has a lot of gatekeepers, and um, I think the film world seems to have even more gatekeepers. And more than that, the path to the gate isn't it's obscured a lot, a lot of the time. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so it's difficult. It's difficult, but it's always interesting to hear hear what people have to say. <laughs> What was the last film that you saw? Uh, I watched Local Hero for the first oh, time. Okay. Oh, right, yeah. Saturday night, yeah. I loved it. So when I was younger, my um, parents, they only had like three VHSs. So they, <laughs> they were not big film people, but they had like The Graduate, Local Hero. And my dad really loved See No Evil, Hear No Evil, which is one of the worst <laughs> things I've ever seen. Um, but yeah, and so... Yeah, Local Hero sat on the shelf for years and I never watched it. And then I was kind of scrolling through film. I didn't realise Four On Demand has like a film section. Um, I didn't know that either, great actually. Great titles on there. Really, really, oh, yeah. really, really good stuff. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I watched that. And it's bonkers. I loved it. I really, really <laughs> enjoyed it. It's kind of, it's a very odd little film. But um, Yeah, I've, I saw it years think, ago, but yeah. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I haven't enjoying. seen it for years and years and years. I saw it in an outdoor. I think the first time, only time I've seen it was like some kind of outdoor projection on a cold night. <laughs> right, I have to yeah, say, yeah. I wasn't really in the, in the best mindset for it, so no. my memory of it was a bit like I just want to go home. But I, uh, I should maybe watch it again in a dry, warm room, and I'm sure I'll, quite, I'll probably enjoy it a lot more. <laughs> I've had a few experiences like that. Yeah, yeah. I think it ruins even a great film. Is if yeah, you're, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what was the last book that you read? I just finished Coming Undone. Um, Terry White, she's the editor of Empire Magazine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And she's written a memoir about her struggles with alcoholism and her abusive childhood. And it is, it is a really tough read. But somehow she just makes it beautiful. It, it's a really, really, really beautiful book. Um, that just kind of, well, I wouldn't say it restores your faith in humanity because there are some bits that, just horrible mm-hmm. but um yeah no it, it's it's definitely worth your time it's kind of it, it's tough but but worth it oh nice okay. okay um and what was the last tv series that you watched or are watching um 
I'm redoing Succession because my oh, wife nice. hasn't uh, seen it. And um, yeah, she is absolutely nice. loving it. Matthew McFadden, she just can't get enough of it. <laughs> he's like, just, yeah, he's brilliant. Tolman, cousin Greg. <laughs> face work when he's trying to convince himself of something that's right. <laughs> yeah. It's just... It's he's actually maybe one of my favorite characters in the sense that he just he knows he's not from that world but he wants to be in that world and he, he's he's trying to fake it a little bit and he's like unsure of himself and he's just he kind of carries all this kind of you know jumble of emotions so well and you feel sorry for him then you hate him and you go back and yeah. forth yeah it's the desperation on his yeah, face it's exactly. just, it's just, and he just gets completely shat on so he shits on Greg beneath the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's just brilliant it's just oh, great. I'm, I've got it because I think season three was supposed to go into production before lockdown. So, we oh, might... so they don't even started. Oh, they didn't even film any of it yet. Is that? Don't know if this, they've started again. Um, hopefully they have, but yeah, it, we we might have a little wait. Yeah, so Brian Cox had said that they had all the scripts ready to go, but um, yeah, I don't think they had started shooting it. Oh, so, right. Yeah. Oh man, so it could be quite a wait for a season three. To I know. Come. I know. So, um, and the, the very last thing we do is an either or. Uh, so there's no correct answers except for some of them. So the first one is <laughs> Love Actually or Starter for 10? Starter for 10, definitely. Um, Mark Kermode or Roger Ebert? Mark Kermode. Nice. Okay. Uh, real book or ebook? Real book. I'm afraid that's the incorrect answer. So we'll move on. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a Kindle. I get anything and I, I can't read on my laptop and I can't read on my phone. It's awful. I have, I have to be holding it. No, I just say reading it on a phone or a laptop, or a, yeah, laptop screen, it's not the nicest experience. But yeah. it's, for me, I, yeah, if it was going to be like an e-book, a Kindle for sure. You it's are. The analog, e-book reader. I think you're it's the like. analog versus digital thing from my projection days. It's kind of yeah. like still up. Yeah, no, fair enough. It, you're like our. 45th or so guest and I think you are the 45th or so person that says real, real book <laughs> no 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 there's definitely been one or two heroes yeah. in there I'm sure yeah. Yeah. are you guys saving the trees then are you like very much like I'm all about saving the trees yeah. and also just to have to pack less books when you go on holiday somewhere I mean it's a very niche uh, time yeah. that I really really enjoy yeah. <laughs> all the holiday I do these days you know but um, yeah <laughs> I'm not quite sure why it's my hill that I die on but I just I do love a Kindle book you got to have a hill to die on <laughs> why is that your hill to die on Tarek that's something <laughs> I've not it's become it's sort of grown as the podcast has gone on I know it's, it's become my Everest I'm not entirely sure what, why it's happened but I am um, I mean if I'm honest with myself I, I don't really have a preference but <laughs> But, but that I ruins your really whole character. Want. I know. <laughs> so I'm trapped in this persona now. I can't change. <laughs> uh, and obviously, I should say that we have recorded a, a bunch of episodes which haven't come out yet, which my numbers are growing. You know, I think, yeah, I think yeah. You might get into double figures one day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that, that was a really fun chat we had. Yeah, it? it was. It was great, I thought. Um, interesting point you had, I thought, about how it only takes two people, really, an agent and an editor, to get a book out there. But mm-hmm. to get your film out there, it's... Yeah, you've got to get, as he was saying, an agent, a producer, possibly an actor. Then you've got other people in the studio that would have to look it over and give you notes. It's it's a much longer process, you know, and I think that's something that other people have said to us as well, is that the book, it sort of stays yours. And once you're done with it, you're done with it kind of a thing. It's published and that's it there. Whereas a film sort of can drag on for uh, even years. um, Yeah. Which, yeah. you know, if you enjoy it, that's great. But, th- you know, they're clearly different beasts. Not And not yeah. just in the writing of them, but in how much time you have to give to them. Yeah, you know? totally. And it's funny because so many people, you know, they, that's the kind of, that's the big break, you know, getting something they've written turned into a film and uh-huh. TV show is a big break. But it, it really is so nebulous. It's so up in the air. And the final product, as you say, can be so different. How many people have you chatted to or how many people are there out there that hated the final product? You know, Yeah. Absolutely, etc. People often hate about it, the, end, the end result, and and yet that's what they're best known for. Perhaps it's it's interesting. It's quite a gamble, almost. Yeah, actually, I was just I was reading something about The Shining this week, actually, which was I've I've never read The Shining, but um, someone was saying that having read The Shining, they could suddenly understand why Stephen King hated the film. Yeah, I think I saw that as well <laughs> on somewhere, and I read The Shining years ago, and it's a very good book, and it's very scary in parts, but um, 
And I'll be honest, I could, it's been so long since I've seen the film version of The Shining, I couldn't quite remember what the differences were. So I actually need to watch the film again. Uh-huh. I've enjoyed, I enjoyed both. And I, I, I think, but I think in whatever it is that I saw that, the, the sort of conclusion was you've just got to appreciate them as, as their own yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. You know, because did, did King not then go on, I mean, there was a TV version of The Shining. I th- the yeah, TV I think there was, there was a very literal. Awful. Yeah, yeah, adaptation yeah. of it that, that, yeah. that wasn't nearly as acclaimed. So yeah, they are, they're very, they, and I think, as an author, if you're giving your story over to someone else, you kind of have to just say, right, I've got the book, it's there. Um, I'm happy with the book. Yeah. And if the film turns out great, brilliant. But if it doesn't, then oh, totally. you can always I go mean, back to the book. As, as the author, you're probably so close to the material, you're not really, you know, there, are, mm-hmm. there has to be concessions made and changes made for a film adaption. And it's difficult, I imagine, if you've written the original work to... To see whether that in the cold light of day, if that's a good or bad choice. I mean, I think that we were talking about that with Dirk Mags last week as well, whether an adaptation is, you know, I think I was saying in the context of comic book stories, I didn't understand why, for example, DC don't mine the 75 mm-hmm. plus years of stories they've got to come up yeah. with something good. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas, <laughs> but you know, and, and having said that though, some of the best adaptations like The Shining are, are, pretty different from the source material as well so yeah. it's and and like watchmen as well the tv series is absolutely. not a straight adaptation but it absolutely relates to the original material in a brilliant yeah. way you know so i think you're right i think you're totally right you needed to trust the person that you're handing over to will make the right choices and and step away from it at that mm-hmm. point, probably so I mean uh, we've kind of gone off track there but uh, <laughs> we've got Owen uh, to thank for that with his, his dual careers and we're really looking, looking forward to hopefully seeing Love Unscripted hit the screen one day as well yeah, but absolutely. the book is available now so go out there and grab it um, thanks very much to Owen for taking the time to appear on the podcast we really appreciate that and next week we've got another interesting guest on the podcast uh, Kathy Bramley who has written a number of uh, best-selling books um, and she's got this really she she went from self-publishing her first book into traditional publishing but she's still sort of it's almost like she's kept a foot in the self-publishing world because there's this serialization that she does of her books it's a sort of very dickens-esque um, is, thing yeah. um, but it, it's massively successful for her to to release her books in in four different parts and we talk about how that can actually help the pace of the story as well, because you're you're having to, you know, build it up and and come to a sort of conclusion for that part each time. So it, it means the story has a natural pace to it that that it perhaps wouldn't if it was a long single thing. Yeah, it's a really interesting technique and one I've not really heard of or used myself. But it's I think people who are interested in how to plan and plot your story will get a lot out of it next week sure. yeah she, she's got a lot of advice um both on that sort of structure side of it but also from the self-publishing side of it as well she's got a really interesting story about how she made a success of that first self-published book mm-hmm. as well so um highly recommend tuning in for that one which i would say of course um, <laughs> but uh, if you enjoyed this episode uh, it would be great if you could take a uh, a couple of seconds to go onto your podcast app and give us a ra- rating and if possible a review we have our ratings have been going up i'm delighted to say the number of ratings so if you are a regular listener please do take the time to give us a rating we'd really appreciate that well i hope you enjoyed that episode if you did please leave a comment down below hit that thumbs up button and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK Page One, as evidenced here. And our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later.